Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Damcasters. And we've got a cracker. I always think we have good episodes for you guys here on the show. But this week, we're going to be looking into what went into the capability assessments of the Japanese in the years leading up to the war in the Pacific kicking off in December 1941. And to do that, we're joined by independent researcher, as he said to be called, Justin Pike. Now, Justin is great. I've been meaning to have him on the show for a long while because he really does have a fantastic way of describing and getting into the nitty gritty of capability assessments, aircraft information, the background to a lot of the things that we take as rote. If you don't believe me there, go check out his hours long video about the zero and well, I'm wearing my Zero t-shirt to commemorate that. We're going to have him back to talk about the Zero. So this week, capability assessments. But there's something coming up because this is episode 91 of the Damcasters. And for our Patreon supporters over on Patreon, funnily enough, our Damcasters, if you will, I'm asking them what they think we should do for episode 100. Now, the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum are going to be continuing to sponsor us, so there may be something to do there. We have some great episodes coming up from the Wings Over the Rockies Museum. That will take us up to about 95, 96. So what we do when it becomes time for episode 100 is going to be fed into by them. So if you join us as a damn here from just three pounds a month, plus a bit of ass on the bottom tier, you can have your say and get your name in the credits at the end of the show. So that's the big plug for this one. What do we do for episode 100? Join the conversation over on Patreon with our damn castiers for that. Now, what we're going to be doing today, as I said, capability assessments into the Japanese. Now, this is going to delve into preconceptions, misconceptions, cultural issues, shall we say, racism. We cover a lot of ground. So we need to start by asking, what the heck is a capability assessment? Welcome to the Downcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Justin. Thank you so much for joining us. This is good. I've been meaning to have you on the show for ages. So we're going to be getting into your wheelhouse here, which is capability assessments in the interwar period about the Japanese and things. And I suppose the first question is, what do we mean by capability assessment? When you're doing your research into these things, what are you looking at? Because are these intelligence reports? Are they just general feeling out what potential other powers are going to be doing? What what are we going to be discussing when we get into this? Uh, yeah. So when we're looking at intelligence assessments, it, it, the, there's two very basic uh, areas you can look at. You can look at capability or intention. Um, so of course, capability is what, what uh, an observer thinks that what they're trying to assess is can actually do. Um, and then intention is what they th are trying to determine they want to do. <laughs> um, so to use the Japanese as an example, it's it's kind of the difference between like that wide body of literature that focuses on, um, are the Japanese going to attack? When are they going to attack? Where are they going to attack? Um, that's all the intention side of things and is of course extremely important. Um, and then the other side of that coin is capability. So how good are their aircraft how good are their pilots how good are their surface ships the the army etc um and of course when you're looking at a, trying to assess if something is a threat you want or in your mind both capability and intention have to align you know if i wanted to punch you that it's like that means i have the intent to do harm but you're thousands of kilometers away from me i have no capability to punch you so therefore, I'm not, at least not an immediate threat. Uh, um, I've, I've been called very punchable, so we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it, that's kind of like they have to align, which means that they, they do 
interact back and forth and indeed assessments of capability can impact assessments of intention because if you are absolutely convinced that something doesn't have the capacity to do what they want to do then you're going to be predisposed to assuming that they're not going to be a problem for you mm -hmm. um so yeah that's kind of the the at least the basic gist of it um as far as like I don't know if you want to get into maybe a little some sources of information uh, just related yeah. to, I guess, Japanese aviation in the interwar years. Well, um, let, let's let's make this personal mm -hmm. for a second. Why did you look towards this as a subject when you were doing all your <sighs> schooling and, and, and things yeah. like that? Um, so I, I guess for lack of a, a better description, I almost kind of fell into it. So I did my Master of Arts degree at uh, the University of Calgary. And it just so happened that Dr. John Ferris was one of the faculty members at the time. And I'm sure probably actually many of your listeners are familiar with him. He wrote, I guess one of the last things he wrote is behind the Enigma um, for GC, um, oh no, GCHQ, that's, um, and uh, he, he's the big intelligence guy. He's done a lot of work on specifically interwar assessment as well on the British side, but still. And I took a lot of his intelligence history courses as an undergraduate and that kind of, I think, planted seeds that would, even if I wasn't necessarily thinking about it when I applied for my MA, they really developed, like I actually ended up writing a paper in one of my uh, graduate level just courses uh, that he was teaching on interwar assessments. Um, and I hadn't really thought of them that much before I wrote that paper, but I ended up loving the process of writing that paper to such a degree that I completely changed what I had originally thought I was going to write on in my in my MA, like, because originally I was going in, I'm like, am I? I was going to look at maybe the uh, look at boring statistical stuff on uh, <laughs> the effectiveness of like U.S. Navy anti-aircraft through the Second World War, something really like technical and mm. yeah, and that completely changed my mindset. I was absolutely drawn in um, because it's just this this combination of looking at technical stuff. To, an understanding of, of how the war plays out itself, looking at uh, different institutions, um, investigating weird quirks of the human mind, because um, all of it is, it's a big melting pot, looking at these assessments of, of all of these different things. Um, and I also like talking about planes and ships. <laughs> and it lets me do that. So, <laughs> yeah, you're in the right place to talk about planes. Boaty stuff, maybe not so much, but yeah, we, we can get into some planes. So, we're going to be specifically looking at the, the assessments of the Japanese here, because I have brutally not spent enough time on this show talking about the Pacific. We started with you know, James Scott and the firebombing in Tokyo, and that was been a bit, a bit about it. We're going to be covering a lot of ground here, aren't we? Because really, Japan bursts into the international consciousness really with the Russo-Sino Sino Russia War, 1904, 1905, Battle of Port Arthur, Butter all that good stuff with the Navy side. But when we start looking at their aerial capability, when when do we start seeing these reports focusing on the aircraft? Because you've sent some fascinating reading and I <laughs> my lunchtime was just basically spent going through all that. So when are we starting and what is the sort of world doing when we start? looking into these things yeah so some of the earliest stuff is really they are taking notice of when the japanese are doing things like you know inching their way into aviation but of course the japanese even if they are technically doing certain things that are remarkable for a particular time like um during the first world war they did launch an aerial attack from aircraft that were had or were from a seaplane tender you know as it's still it's novel stuff, but they had virtually no experience beyond those very, very that very early experimentation in the First World War with aviation. So they kind of missed this this massive conflict uh, that was occurring, particularly in Europe um, with just what this wide um, scale air campaign and the Japanese sat it out uh, effectively. So where Japanese aviation really started to seriously develop, try to initially try to catch up with uh, Western aviation was immediately post-war. Um, so like from 1919, really, um, you get both the British uh, unofficial 
aviation mission to Japan for the Navy. Um, and then you also have a French air aviation mission that was predominantly focused on helping out the Japanese army. Um, and those are kind of the earliest foundations for when the Japanese are trying to play a lot of catch up. So yeah, it is, it is mostly focused on the interwar period just because prior to that point, it's not like the Japanese were totally not doing anything with aviation. It's just that it was so small scale that, uh, there wasn't really a whole lot to pay attention to. Because one of the things that jumped out to me there is you've got a lot of guys who had worked within industry. Um, I can't remember which of the papers you sent, but guys from shorts, ex-sop with people, all ending up at places like Mitsubishi and things. So they're getting, much like they did on the, on the shipbuilding and the Navy side, they're spotting talent and bringing it in to start supercharging their understanding of where the West is, aren't they? Yes, exactly. Um, so through much of the 1920s in particular, that is how the Japanese have decided to try to develop their aviation. Um, is they were looking, they're looking for the best they can find. So of course the Navy, as has, they had traditionally done, turned to the British. Um, the Army, as they had traditionally done, turned to the uh, French. Although the Germans would actually start coming into the picture toward the later uh, part of the 1920s. Um, and then they really, both services actually developed quite an infatu infatuation with the Germans in particular, like in the mid 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. And yeah, they were trying to play catch up. And it's not just like on, on aviation development side, like, you know, they're bringing in foreign experts to train pilots, to train ground crews, to advise them on how to build aircraft factories. They're, they're, um, purchasing production licenses for all sorts of foreign aircraft. And they are just trying to play catch up by, by following in the footsteps of the, the world leaders. And how does this start to play into those capability assessments? Is that information getting fed back when these guys return? Or is there the distance issue starting to... I suppose the question I'm really asking is... <laughs> Where, do, where, where in your research do you start seeing these things happen? Yeah, um, I guess like I'll, so I'll step back for a moment because uh, since we're already talking about um, basically what's going on in the 1920s, like with Japan trying to catch up, um, I, I should mention like in general, what sources are uh, people like me or people at the time, what were they looking at to try and figure out what was going on? Um, and there are a couple, oh, yeah. You, no, no, I was just going to say, we're, we're sort of seeing all this sort of post Meiji restoration mm -hmm. explosion in Japanese life, aren't we? This is the sort of thing we're, we're, we're looking at, isn't it? Yeah. And that's going to work in big when we open the, uh, the big old can of worms of, of national characteristics and all of that as well. <laughs> um, but first I'll just cover the briefly here just like some sources so they did actually rely quite heavily on open sources related to trying to figure out what was going on with japanese aviation stuff like newspapers and other press reports you know official releases from like the japanese diet like budget debates and things like that um also official releases from other uh, other organizations like for example the japanese navy would usually release some kind of summary of like their annual naval maneuvers um, and the army would do similar things as well. Um, there's also, they were, they were paying attention to popular writers. Um, so people like, uh, Fletcher Pratt, uh, whom some people might uh, be familiar with. He was writing, I have a book from him over there, I think from 39, if I recall correctly. Um, also enthusiast aviation magazines as well. Um, they're paying attention to those. In fact, they were often encouraged to pay attention to things like newspapers and aviation magazines and that, things of that nature. Um, and that was paired also with what we'd call closed sources, but they were mostly above board. So like observations of Japanese aviation and industry made by military attaches, other U.S. and foreign military personnel, or Western civilians who are assisting with the development of the Japanese aviation industry. Um, tours of naval air stations and aircraft factories. Um, so, you know, these official tours that makes up a significant body of the material. And as far it's the largest um, body of material found in classified reporting that we're 
if we're setting aside um, like summaries of newspapers, uh, which they were, that's a lot of reporting. Um, now that the act of recruiting of spies was actually discouraged in peacetime, particularly in the US Navy, though information from various uh, informants was occasionally passed along. A couple of examples I can think of aren't actually aviation related, but uh, very detailed information on the regunning of the Mogami class heavy cruisers um, and the uh, information on the Type 93 uh, very capable torpedo. That was actually passed on by a couple of different informants and given the accuracy of the information, very good ones um, to the US Naval Attaché. Um, and then there's also, you know, just basically combat assessments and observations of the Japanese air services made by people that were witnessing them, like, you know, the Americans, the Chinese, British uh, observers, whoever happens to be around and can see the Japanese actually fighting. Um, and then this matters a lot less for aviation specifically, but signals intelligence is at least in the mix. Um, again, it matters a bit more for the surface fleet, but they do at least draw some information from that kind of thing. I don't know if you want me to like explain a little bit about military attaches, because they're the single most important source of information. So they're distilling all this stuff, and that's what makes up the bulk of the reporting. I, I think it would be good, because it's one of those things that we all know the name, and immediately we go, spy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's what you know john le carre yeah. tells us you know they're the guys that get <laughs> kicked out as soon as something goes wrong but what what are, what are the what are these people doing yeah so they're officially attached of course to the embassies um and the the ones that are most relevant for japan unsurprisingly you might have to sit down for this but they'd be in tokyo um or in china as well those ones do matter and they are the, the key vehicle through which all of this intelligence gathering about japanese aviation is is being carried out, um, like overwhelmingly, it's it's through the attaches. They're the ones that are transport uh, tra uh, translating newspaper articles, or at least their staff are. Um, they're the ones that are providing some of the analysis, uh, asking questions, taking photos, uh, that kind of thing, doing the tours of naval air stations and, and things of that nature. Now, one um, particular detail that is of note for aviation is that. They had a uh, military attaches often had assistant attaches, and specifically there were there was a the position in both uh, the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy um, for an assistant naval attaché for air matters. Um, so specifically, somebody that knows aviation, so they're typically just an aviator um, who can process that often very technical information and just has an understanding of flight and everything like that. Um, now the US Navy, they were informally sending an, an aviation expert to Japan to kind of keep an eye on Japanese Navy aviation from 1927, the Asiatic fleet would send somebody over. This was actually formalized in 1935 where they sent somebody with the actual title of assistant naval attache for air matters, um, just to take the pressure off the main naval attache and, and bring their their aviation expertise into the reporting. Now, a major issue here with some of the reporting on the Army side is that they never sent an assistant naval uh, assistant attache for air matters to Japan um, the entire interwar period. They did send them to other countries like uh, the UK, um, Germany, et cetera, but never to Japan because they just they deemed it was never important enough to follow aviation developments in Japan that closely. Um, so instead, the assistant attaches on the, the army side, they were typically an infantry or artillery officer, and they were kind of left to try and just figure out what was going on with Japanese aviation, despite having no background in it uh, themselves. And you can definitely see that come through in some of the reporting. They're, they're professional officers. They're trying their best. It's not like all of their reporting is bad, but they're definitely missing things or some of their analysis comes off as very strange because they just don't have any kind of experience really with, uh, with aviation. Be because the development of Imperial Japanese Navy aviation, Imperial Japanese Army aviation is very similar to that that we see elsewhere. There's a, a good, healthy, competitive nature between, between the two, isn't, isn't there? So with that filtering down, you're going to, I, I suppose that's why we saw, or we do continue to see that lesser understanding of the army aviation side than we do 
the in-depth side of the Navy. Yeah, that, that is a very good point is uh, just generally like historiographically speaking, there is a lot we don't know about the development of the Japanese Army Air Service. Uh, unfortunately, like I'm, I'm, I do my best to learn Japanese, but it is nowhere near usable enough for actual academic work, unfortunately. Um, and what we have available in English, it's to say there are gaps does a disservice to gaps. It's more like a black hole <laughs> in many areas. Um, and there's you can get little snippets here and there, but there's been nothing written like uh, Mark Petey's sunburst on the on the Japanese Navy or service where it ends in 41, but it's it just gives you this nice institutional kind of survey of like what that Japanese Navy or service was about. And we don't have a, a comparable uh, equivalent to for that uh, on the army side, unfortunately. And yeah, I mean, I guess you could you could definitely make an argument that that it, largely that indifference does stretch back before the war. I mean, the um, yeah, the military intelligence uh, division didn't really show that much interest in Japanese army aviation, um, whereas the Navy took watching Japanese uh, naval developments more seriously. I'm, I'm just possible. Is that because of the sort of hangover from the early 20th century naval battles when everyone was like, oh, th these guys are actually quite good at what they're doing? considering the, the shock against the Russians. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a sizable part of it. Is the US Navy, of course, like with their their uh, like the orange plans and they, they were thinking about Japan a lot more than the US Army was. Um, so, of course, that bleeds into everything else um, is is that the US Navy is very keenly interested in what the Japanese Navy is up to. The US Army is much less so interested in what the Japanese Army is up to. And that's like there's Generally speaking, I mean, this we're not going to get into it, obviously, here in any detail whatsoever, but I have actually looked through the, the U.S. Army assessments of the Japanese Army, like, ground forces, and they're actually pretty good. Um, if I had to, out of the three main branches of power, you know, land, air, sea, uh, I think the strongest assessments overall are, as far as accuracy goes, are for the, the land forces, um, it go, and then followed by probably the naval forces, and then the weakest are for air. Um, I would argue. I, I guess that's because they're able to look at what the army is doing a lot more in China. Yeah, that's it. That's a part of it. They also have, they were attaching lots of officers to different uh, Japanese military uh, regiments, including some that were even seeing combat. Um, like I have very detailed reports uh, from the 1933 uh, Rehi campaign and all that were and beautiful photographs and everything I've never seen anywhere else before where they were, walking through like all these things with Japanese aviation or sorry, uh, the, the army. Um, there's actually some good aviation stuff in there related to air, very early attempts at aerial resupply, um, where I've got some really fun quotes from that. They managed to translate from uh, Japanese officers writing about it. I think they called um, when they were dropping bags of rice at a planes for, for troops that were advancing, they, they were like uh, f flower petals from heaven. Um, and they had like little, they had a kind of amusing, amusing in hindsight anyway, lessons learned for uh, for uh, aerial transporter supplies, like maybe don't just throw sacks of rice out of planes, <laughs> uh, because they had a tendency to either hit things or hit the ground and just explode and you've just wasted all the, <laughs> the rice. But um, yeah, little, little things like that come up in, in the reporting all the time. All right. Well, let's let's dive into this. I'm I'm going to let you you lead me more than anything here, because what are we seeing as as time goes on? Because we're we're going to say the race thing right to end, because we can put a, a stake in that quite quickly. But let's get into what is being fed back through that sort of late 1920s, early 1930s, mm -hmm. into the the Chinese invasion in, in Manchuria. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll quickly run through the 20s. So again, since we meant, as we mentioned, kind of at the top of the, the podcast here, that it was an it was an era where the Japanese were definitely heavily dependent on foreign assistance. And that has a very obvious impact on assessments, because now you don't just have to talk to the Japanese or try to figure out what they're up to. You go and talk to a British guy who was literally training Japanese pilots or, or a French guy. Um, you go talk to, you know, a, a British or a French or an, or an American um, 
aviation industry expert who's been employed at you know Mitsubishi or any of these other Jap um, Japanese aviation firms, and you ask them, hey, like how's that factory going that you helped set up? And that was feeding back a lot of very detailed, very useful information. It was fairly straightforward to just straight up have just direct information, like technical information on pretty much every aircraft the Japanese were using because they were British or French. And not even like the latest British or French models. In many cases, they were ones that had been approved for export. And it made tracking so, those just, kinds of details. Yeah. Sorry, just to dive in, because a lot of fabulous people on the Patreon raised that question with you. Mm -hmm. That is specific to the 20s, is it? That sort of working alongside their Western counterparts. Josh Wardman asked that question. He was saying, do we see that for a long period? Or is it really just mm. in that 20s that we're seeing the influx of, we'll call it talent. I'm doing air quotes if you're listening. Yeah, overwhelmingly, it's the story of the, the 20s in particular. It's not like it just like, you know, you hit 1930 and it just stops. Um, there's still trickle trickling on from there. And we can discuss that a little bit when we get a little later on. Um, but definitely as far as this, like, I would almost describe it as like moving in lockstep behind the world leaders. Um, because there was that recognition that, hey, we'd sat out the big one, um, basically, um, ending in 1918, and we need to catch up. Uh, there'd been so many developments, we don't know where to even start. So who do we approach? Well, if we're the Japanese Navy, we go talk to our British friends and they'll help us out. And they did a lot. I guess it's as uh, John Ferris described it in his book on, on British assessments, uh, where he, you know, the, the British offered the, the Japanese Navy the opportunity to kind of make the leap from 1914 to, to the 1920s. And the Japanese made that leap. And this again this it, it meant that it was relatively easy to track what the japanese were up to and assessments of again like the aircraft and everything they were they weren't praiseworthy because basically the japanese are kind of just using last year's model um imported from elsewhere they're still very much learning on the on the personnel side of things this is where things get a lot messier generally the assessments skewed negative and there were definitely elements at times you could find of just racism or ethnocentrism or discussion of national characteristics um which is something that probably since i'm going to be start talking about it we ha i think we'll have to do a little aside here and explain that um in my defense, you said leave the race thing to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, yeah, now that I'm like going through it, I'm like, uh, we'll have to do it. Um, yeah, so let me just finish the 1920s here. The, the overall impression is their personnel, they are very much students, they're, they're learning. Um, some observers are like, they do give them credit that they might improve. There are others. Um, particularly the British quite strongly because of the national characteristics that we're going to talk about. There was an assumption that if we get our foot in the door um, and help the Japanese Navy develop their aviation, then these copyists will basically be beholden to our interests forever. We'll have a reliable export customer for all of our aviation. Um, we can really keep tabs on them. They're not going to run away from us. Um, because there's an assumption that the Japanese couldn't learn um, or and innovate. Um, they were unimaginative. And as far as another key thing that I, before we move on to the, the race and the, the national characteristics that I really want to highlight is even from this 1920s, there was a lot of reporting that was underlining very heavily weaknesses that were honestly correct. So weaknesses in the Japanese aviation industry, like a very heavy reliance on the Im on imported machine tools, um, a lack of aircraft reserves, um, a shortage of, of pilots and mechanics, um, a shortage of raw materials. Basically, it was it was observers looking at Japanese air power holistically and saying, if they get into a serious air war with one of us, um, they're not going to be able to sustain it over the long period. We'll be able to grind them down in a war of attrition and their air power will not, will not hold up to ours, um, was the general conclusion, even back in the 1920s. Um, 
So now with that wrapped up, I think we can turn to the... <laughs> so so at a strategic level, very mm. early on, they're, they're almost spot on, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and that is definitely something that the recent historiography has, has underlined. I sent you that Greg Kennedy article. He does a great job of that, um, where, yeah, they are noting that, like, yes, okay, you can find racist comments about Japanese pilots. You can find... Um, not so much the 1920s, but later on where they start getting certain technical things wrong with, with Japanese aviation. But one thing that does remain pretty consistently accurate is they are looking at like, okay, well, they don't have enough pilots to, to absorb attrition. They don't have enough trained mechanics to absorb attrition. Their, their aviation industry is largely based on machine tools we give them. Um, and the second we stop giving them the, those machine tools, it's going to create huge bottlenecks. They're not going to be able to scale production um, to match, come even close to matching us. So other very keen observations like that um, are are right from the, the 20s and carry through. Okay. So let's look at those, shall we say, hmm. cult, cult cultural issues that yeah the western eye was was casting over japan mm -hmm. um and I've, you know of course like so a lot of people if you if you bring up um pre-war assessments of, of japanese military capability people will immediately think uh yeah just oh they were all racist and all the reporting was terrible because they were racist um and there is a kernel of truth in there um but it's a lot more nuanced and complex so uh, in all my notes here, I actually don't use the word racism very much. And it's not because I'm afraid of it. It's because it, the, the issue ran deeper than that. So I, I, it's kind of, it's more like a prejudice or national characteristics, which is a, the, not even a, just a historiographical term, but a term that saw use at the time. Uh, I even have a report from a, a, a U.S. Naval attache from, I think it was 21, 1921, um, where he has, he just wrote a list and he literally called it Japanese national characteristics. And then he had about a list of 50 stereotypes um, of the Japanese. Now, different scholars will place more or less emphasis on like prejudice, like racism and its impact on interwar assessments. Generally speaking, the older stuff, like stuff from the 80s, pl uh, places a lot more emphasis on prejudice and its impact on assessments. And then stuff that's more recent, like particularly from the 2010s, uh, plays down the impact uh, to get very mildly spicy. I would argue maybe we've uh, pushed it a little too far in the other direction. Um, that's kind of my own take on that. And again, the reason why I'm emphasizing that more prejudice instead of um, racism is because it's racism is there and it's an undeniable element of what is going on, particularly at lower levels, like when you're looking at Joe Blow pilot um, or people in popular circles, not like the, the military attaches as much, um, like the military professionals, um, but it is having an impact because if somebody, if, if a pilot is holding a lot of very strong racist feelings towards the Japanese and they're, and then you hand them like a field manual or something that's trying to explain to them that the Japanese maybe aren't that bad, um, you might not necessarily get through to them. It doesn't matter if the the report that you have isn't explicitly racist if the person reading it is a racist and that that's kind of where it, it gets really really messy um now so, sorry oh, yeah, so are we ahead. are we sort of saying that we're looking at tier one nations and people involved in tier one looking at like a tier two that they're, they're, they're looking down yeah, because like, they're yeah they're bush league where the pros that sort of thing yeah so the, it's it's just a it's a cocktail of everything there's you can have like just straight up just like you know scientific racism like you can find examples of oh the japanese are myopic and they can't see properly and that is why they are bad pilots you can find you can find quotes like that in fact fletcher pratt in his book from 1939 that's the quote most uh you could see it quoted over and over again because yeah. it's really juicy and he lists out they have a poor sense of balance because they were carried on their mother's backs as children and that kind of stuff. And then you can have just ethnocentrism. So maybe Japanese practice is, is differing and not even just ethnocentrism, but also like institutional centrism or, or bias, where it's just like the Japanese are doing something differently and different is bad. <laughs> um, I, I have one report. It, it's an, 
it doesn't really damage the overall assessment of the report, but I find it amusing where it was a, it was a British officer. This was forwarded on by the US Navy attache anyway, but uh, it was a British officer it was touring a naval Japanese naval air sta station. And instead of saying things were good, anytime he liked the look of something, he was calling it British. <laughs> Um, of course. Well, why why yeah. wouldn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah it's it just a funny little example of, of that where, yeah, just substituting British for good. And then there is the these national characteristics. Now, what the heck are these? Well, in, in very basic terms, uh, national characteristics are a set of national stereotypes. So it's not based on race so much. It's based on usually environmental factors and, and cultural factors that they they feel like they've been observing and that this they use it to inform um, the information that they are processing. Um, and then they also can, in some cases, use it, like rely on them wholeheartedly to try to predict, even if they don't have hard evidence. Um, and the reason why this is goes well beyond race is that, for example, like this is what a lot of nations were doing when they were looking at other nations. So there are national characteristics for the Germans that impact American assessments of the Germans. And they're not being racist towards the Germans. They just have an assumption that the Germans are efficient. They are martial. They are innovative militarily. And we have a lot to learn from them. So when you're looking at intelligence assessments of the Germans, they go in with that mindset and they they interpret information they are receiving in that mindset. Um, this even penetrates into the, the post-war period where uh, American reporting, like um, like surveys and stuff they send into Germany post-war tend to be far more robust than they do for Japan because they're going in to Germany expecting to learn things from these gods of war as opposed to Japan where they're kind of going in to just kind of yeah, you know, I know. Look under a couple couch cushions and go like, "Oh yeah, they weren't good." So and this is uh, sorry to interrupt. This is this is the things that we then see with the the staff rides, this, the federations, the Gagarians, the people people like that, where you never see any of that from Japan, despite the incredible advances they made. Yeah, there's there's definitely a a connection there. Mm. Um, like these are very very strong, powerful things, and they. Uh, these national characteristics for Japan, the ones that really matter for aviation are, again, the assumption that the Japanese, they can't innovate, they are imitative, they're, they're unimaginative. And this was based on observations, at least going back to the middle 19th century, where of course, Japan starts to come out of its isolation, at least compared to the Western powers, they weren't isolated to, from China, or Korea, but from the Western and they're trying to catch up and they're they're importing all sorts of things from the west they're and they're uh, like americans and others are observing this and they it starts to develop this this stereotype of all the japanese can do is imitate and it it becomes very ingrained and since it's so well established even from the middle of the 19th century it means by the time it gets to where we pick up the story here in the interwar years you're talking about like stereotypes that are so firmly established that like observers that were reading in the 1920s like were not even born um, when these were being laid down so it's like it's almost immutable fact to them um, that this is just how the Japanese are and it's uh, it can be a very dangerous and very powerful thing it can lead to genuine confusion when you're trying to understand the report reporting in hindsight because like i have almost like an orange and a strawberry analogy so you'll you'll be reading this wonderful report that is vividly describing what is very obviously an orange and then in the conclusion they assertively state that it's a strawberry and then you're left sitting there and you're like how did we get here um, and a lot of my time has been spent almost breaking my brain trying to rationalize or like find patterns when it comes to things like national characteristics. And I, I'm starting to come to the conclusion that it's like you can't quite rationalize it because the human mind is not rational in many cases. <laughs> They're just relying on almost stock language or they are so determined that this is the way the Japanese are that even if they are presenting accurate information at times, they they just can't see, they can't connect the dots, those final dots that would allow them to make a more accurate conclusion. Um, 
and I guess the one of the final things we'll say on the national characteristics is that uh, John Ferris describes it as like a deck of cards. So you've got like this big stack of, of stereotypes and there'll be different ones at play at different times. Different ones will be emphasized in different subjects um, versus others. Sometimes they'll be removed from play entirely for maybe up to decades and then suddenly they'll make a reappearance when they're when they're relevant. Um, they can be shuffled around, they can be paired together, and it makes it makes them very, very powerful analytical tools uh, at the time. And again, one of my other spicier takes is that I think some of these have actually trickled into the post-war historiography without people fully realizing that uh, these ideas are older than than they think. I, oh, I guess I, I didn't, I got sidetracked again. So other than the unimaginative and the could not innovate stereotype, the other one would be um, usually the Japanese lacked initiative. Uh, they were uninspired, inflexible, easily shaken by surprise situations. That one tends to work in a little bit more when you're looking at assessments of Japanese personnel, um, particularly pilots, because of course, if you're an aviator and you think that the people you're observing are uninspired and they're, they're not individualistic at all, and they, they, they can't handle surprise situations that they're not going to make for very good airmen. Um, hmm. That doesn't last long. In reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I guess we can roll on into the the 30s, if you like. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think the, the 30s are when things get interesting. In in the um, in one of the the, the uh, elements you sent over about the reassessment of the fellow Singapore, it was interesting there that in 1929 the Imperial Navy, Imperial Japanese Navy. Air Force was 300% bigger than the fleet air arm, which is boggling. And these assessments are coming back saying, yeah, they're, 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 they're all right. When in reality, they are funneling far more resources into this than the Royal Navy, who they're looking to as the service. <laughs> Yeah, and really from roughly 1930-31, this is where something that I hadn't really brought up before in the, for the 1920s, it, it, but it starts to come into the fore in a big way, and that is secrecy. So typically people will think, well, the Japan, you know, closed society, quite secretive just generally, but the 1920s were relatively open. So in addition to asking Western observers, one thing I didn't really mention is that they could get a lot of information just from like touring naval air stations, touring factories. They were very open, very casual. They could just ask, like I have like a letter that uh, the naval attache sent to the um, Japanese Navy ministry. And it's just a list of questions like, how many planes do you have? What are they? Uh, like everything. And they, the, the Navy ministry just answered all of them. <laughs> um, and that starts to shift in a big way from about 1930, 31, because of course, politically, you, the, the Japanese, so that the, the Anglo-Japanese alliance has long since collapsed. Um, the 1930 London Naval Conference really uh, hit the, the Japanese Navy hard. Um, they were not happy with, with foreign powers like the United States or, or the British. Um, there was a further chill in, in foreign relations because of course there was the invasion of Manchuria in 1931, 32. Um, they, they leave the League of Nations. Um, there's the 1932 Battle of Shanghai. Um, so the Japanese are becoming increasingly paranoid of, of outside observers. You know, military attaches and other foreigners, like um, people that are being employed in, in aviation factories and things of that nature, they were increasingly viewed as spies. They were, I've got lots of reports of, initially people were taken aback by this. You can tell about this this change because it was like they're annoyed that now they have to like register with the police and there's clearly people following them and they, they just, they can't ask the kind of questions they do. Um, one thing I, I did in my thesis is I took a, a few years worth of um, tours of Naval Air Stations from like kind of the early thirties into the mid thirties before they stopped entirely um, and just, tried to track like the decline in access and it, you know it kind of goes from very open in the 1920s and then like the reports just keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter and the sections where they're complaining about how they can't actually get any 
information start getting longer and longer. Um, and, and toward the end, it's kind of like they're just putting in stock phrases of like, I guess the Naval Air Station looks efficient. They didn't let me see anything really. And this has a great impact on the quality of assessments. And this is played up a lot in a lot of the new historiography, rightfully so. One key thing that I think needs to be emphasized, though, is that secrecy in and of itself doesn't create errors, <laughs> um, particularly the kind of errors we're seeing. What it does is more insidious, and that is once you start losing access to a lot of good information, what do you do? Uh, well, you start going on what you think the Japanese do. And what do you think the Japanese do? Well, they copy and they imitate and they're not imaginative. They don't so, have initiative. So, so by losing that easy access, you fall back upon preconception because you don't yeah. have those channels to get the information. And then what makes it doubly insidious for aviation specifically is that as we just discussed in the 1920s, they're not completely wrong related specifically to aviation. What were the Japanese air services doing in the 1920s? They're learning from foreign powers. They're, they're using license uh, aircraft that were produced under license. They need foreign experts in their in factories and help train their pilots. Um, so they pair those, that factual information with these national characteristics and through the 1930s, you see this just intensifying, um, like in hardening, um, as this this has to be the case. Um, and this also leads to an increase in, in reliance on open sources. So a lot of the reporting starts to just be, we translated a, a newspaper article um, that was happened to be talking about Japanese aviation. And this is paired again, like they're just getting hit from every angle here is that in this period is a very key period for uh, particularly Japanese like technical and tactical and doctrinal innovation in both air services. So from like 19, uh, the late 1920s, um, the Japanese army was was really going through it. They were get, taking budget cuts um, and toward the, uh, the end, what they wanted to do was cut multiple uh, army divisions and use that money to help modernize the army. And a significant part of that was to massively expand the Japanese Army Air Service. Um, and then of course, with the signing of the 1930 London Naval Treaty, um, suddenly the Japanese Navy, they couldn't spend all they wanted on the surface fleet anymore. So where are they going to put the money? Well, <laughs> into things that can get around the treaties and help make up for their, their shortage in, in surface strength, which was land-based aviation. Um, so they both just start dumping huge amounts of money in. They are trying to push the AV, their aviation industry away from just relying on, on foreign aircraft. They're like, you guys, like it was this slow period from the late 1920s, but they're like, you know, they're starting to come out of their infancy as far as they, the ability to design their own aircraft. And this was the period where you saw the, you know, the design requirements laid out for specifically Japanese and indigenously produced aircraft. And they start to even enter service towards the end of this period, um, like from the mid mid 1930s. I mean, on the Navy side, you've got the G3M and the A5, uh, G3M, land-based attack aircraft, so like their medium bomber, and the A5M, which is the predecessor to the, the Zero, they're, so their um, monoplane carrier-borne fighter, those both show up in this period. And again, this is at a time when Western observers are predisposed to believing that the Japanese are still just copying foreign designs, therefore they're going to, their aircraft are going to be intrinsically inferior because they are just copying foreign designs. There's a lot of, uh, as the kids would say, copium going on where you can, it almost starts to get farcical um, where when they're observing these indigenous Japanese aircraft, they are like, I almost picture them just desperately thumbing through uh, aircraft, like, you know, Jane's fighting planes, trying to find the foreign design that it was clearly a copy of. And it starts to get to a point where you've got multiple different reports just throwing out like planes that this is clearly a copy of and they're they're all mutually contradicting like they can't figure out among themselves what it was a copy of the one thing that they all agree on is it's definitely a copy of something and this also starts to undermine assessments of japanese personnel um 
I, I'm not going to say that it's like it shifts super negative in this period. I think they still remain kind of skewed and negative. They're like, you can find people that say they're good. You can find people that say they're really bad. You can find people in the middle all over the place. I would generally say that they you almost universally place the quality of Japanese personnel below that of like the themselves, the Americans. Um, and the British would kind of do the similar type of thing. But they didn't like downrate them massively um, in this period. And again, assessments of, of strategic weaknesses. So, you know, the weaknesses in the aviation industry, like as far as materials go, reliance on machine tools, lack of aircraft reserves, all of that remains accurate. And, and consistent through this this period as well. And I kind of chopped this period off in 37 with, of course, the start of the the uh, war in China. From a personnel perspective, you, you do have you know, Hirokoshi and, and people like that who are superb engineers, superb designers, as, as you'd see with the Zero and, and the Raiden a li little bit later. They're not mugs and they have learned from the copying and yeah, you know, this same goes in in Germany. The was it the BMW eight hundred two is a copy of a Pratt and Whitney. So yeah, you know, or it started as a copy of a of a Pratt and Whitney. So it's mm -hmm. it's not unusual. But again, those cultural things start coming in again. Hang on, these guys can't be doing it. There's not that intuitive leap to say, okay, they've learned and they've taken that next step. Yeah, and I, I, I'll plug one book that I have nothing to do with, but uh, Wings for the Rising Sun by Ergen Meltzer is probably, arguably, probably one of, if, probably the most important book ever written on Japanese aviation in English. Uh, I think I'll put that claim out there, um, where he's taught, it's an entire book that is specifically about just the development of the Japanese, of Japanese aviation and what various foreign powers contributed to it at different times. Yeah, it's fascinating seeing this this development and, and one little thing is that like usually when the british were helping them out in the early 1920s because they had such a strong mindset of all the japanese do is copy usually their their idea of like helping aircraft designers in particular was just kind of throwing like drawings at them and saying copy this um whereas later on when they start bringing in certain um german designers they did something quite different in that they were teaching the Japanese how to design aircraft, um, not just copying like drawings. And that's why you, you actually see a lot of the, the earliest generation of new kind of indigenous Japanese designs. They tend to look uh, very German in some ways, uh, particularly like Mitsubishi bomber designs, because they were learning directly from Junkers how how to design aircraft and it's like they weren't copying things they were like they were confronted with these basic aerodynamic problems and they're like how do we solve it well i learned at yonkers that this is how we do it um so if you look at for example a photograph of a g3m um it's it's a japan it's entirely indigenous japanese aircraft um but the certain design elements are, are definitely like you can see that lineage from from Junkers. And that's that's the kind of thing that would absolutely break the brains of, of a lot of uh, like American observers that are trying to look at this because you see anything that is even remotely related at some point to something German. And their favorite, like they, it was called a copy of almost anything you can imagine for twin engine aircraft of the period. But so usually the most common motifs were like something German, like it was a Heinkel, it was a Junkers, it was a combination of a Heinkel and a Junkers, it was a Heinkel plus a DC-2. It was, um, but um, yeah, that, it, it's it's kind of fascinating seeing how, how the Japanese developed uh, in that way, and then just foreign observers trying to grapple with that, um, while well, they have less and less access throughout. What one thing that we we should de delve into really is the the reports that are coming back from Chenault and the volunteer groups in in China as well, because they're 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 getting English language reports about fighting these latest generations of indigenous aircraft how were they received were these cultural perceptions again butting up against well to be fair Claire Chenault could you know start an argument in an empty room couldn't he so <laughs> so how, how how were those reports coming back because they didn't land with may, maybe the influence that they should have 
initially, should they? Yeah, so this this 37 to 41 period is, that's where the, the bulk of the historiography focuses. That's where, on really, the lot of the largest errors begin to occur, unfortunately, right before actual war. Um, and that is like the, the Japanese, they pretty much close almost every door they can as far as um, information security goes. Like tours of naval air stations stop. Um, I can't remember when attachments to Japanese army units stopped. It probably might have been around the same time. The Japanese actually passed a secrecy law on August 37. Um, that's just trying to close every avenue for information gathering that the the Americans had kind of relied on up to that point. Of course, the press itself is increasingly censored as a result of that law as well. Um, like one, it, it becomes maniacal. I mean, they're, they, they're very restrictive about what photos they'll allow to be published even. Um, and then it's, it's actually a legacy we still have to this day is if you see a lot of photos of like, for example, G3Ms and things in China, the photos that we all, the photos that we have or many of them are crudely censored. Um, and it's like a, a legacy from that time. Like you'll see their, their tail codes are crossed out crudely or my favorite are the more artistic censoring where they use the, uh, the engine cowling of the bomber they're in to obscure the tail code of the bomber they're taking a picture of. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate those ones more, but um, yeah. So this just feeds back into those preconceptions. Cause now it's like, well, you got even less information than you had before we just have to keep relying on what we think the Japanese are doing. Um, however, as you point out, there's a big war going on. Um, and there are lots of people that can observe decent chunks of it, particularly early on when the fighting is like over Shanghai, because there are foreign concessions in Shanghai. There are a lot of people that can watch this. Um, USS, oh, trying to remember, I think it's USS Augusta, uh, is there. They're, take, they're writing all sorts of reports. Um, Fourth Marine Regiment as well. They're all sending this stuff back, various attaches. Um, and a lot of that reporting of direct observation of what the Japanese are doing in China is actually very good. In fact, it's so good that just outside of my study of, of interwar assessments, I use parts of some of these assessments um, to track the development of Japanese aviation from 37 to 41 because the observations are that keen. Um, and yes, you do have to filter out some stuff that comes up. And when you develop an eye for looking where they're they're going awry, um, you can pull a lot of value out of these reports um, just generally. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that the, the most heavily observed part of the war, so kind of like 37, 38, um, that part of the war, the Japanese air services are struggling quite a bit in a lot of areas. There's the Japanese Navy, they're, they're struggling with um, formation flying and sending in any significant number of bombers. Um, one thing that Chenault and others note is that like they'd see a very loose bomber formation come in. I think Chenault kind of snidely, he's like, J uh, Jap bomber formations, such as they are, break up over the target. Um, and then they bomb individually or, you know, like there's things like that. Um, and they're not wrong. The, the Japanese, this is a huge learning curve for the, for the Japanese air services, particularly the Navy, which, you know, in the words of the, of the late great Mike, Mark Petey had to learn how to attack a continent. And they had a lot to, to grapple with. And they're reporting back all of these weaknesses of, and struggles for the, for the Japanese air services, much of it accurate. Um, on the technical side, again, they are there are a lot of funny instances of their seeing G3Ms flying at you know several thousand meters, but they can definitely tell you that it's a Heinkel with British engines or whatever. Um, and this reporting, it is making it back. It, it it is being factored into different assessments. I guess to fast forward just a little bit to like forty forty one, with uh, the zero, some of that information is it's so accurate that it ends up giving them the wrong impression, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So uh, in, in very brief, Japanese Navy fighter tactics were actually quite um, similar to U.S. Navy tactics. They tended to emphasize uh, energy fighting in the vertical uh, and hit and run tactics, which I know is like almost mind blowing for a lot of people because they assume they just turn fight everything, but they don't. And they're observing this in China and the entirely reasonable conclusion they come to is that the reason why they don't want to turn fight all this stuff in their zeros is because the zero lacks maneuverability. 
Um, so then they start getting the impression that the zero is has poor low speed maneuverability and that is why they are constantly using vertical maneuvers and energy fighting and this makes it even into the uh the u.s army like field manual for like aircraft identification and everything uh the the issue from the last one issued before the war which i think is march 41 it doesn't have a photo like even a drawing of a zero but it does have a comment that they've observed that zeros avoid acrobatic maneuvers as they say um which of course can lead to it was an accurate observation that led to an incorrect bit of intelligence on the zero that contributed to confusion around that aircraft at least initially um and th these kinds of things like they happen a lot although there's still a lot of good stuff like uh <laughs> particularly the development of of uh japanese bombing and all that because like again early on in the war it's like you said they send in maybe six to nine planes they can barely hold formation they kind of bomb inaccurately and and they don't do all that much and then by the time you get to 1940 um they've developed very sophisticated uh like they, they send in reconnaissance aircraft they're they're checking whether they are flying sorties that are, have 90 to 100 plus aircraft in them um hundreds and hundreds of kilometers deep into the Chinese interior. They're preceding the, the attacks with, with fighter sweeps. They have a pretty sophisticated um, de development for, for fighter escort. And it, this is recorded in, in U.S. reporting and talking with the Chinese um, that the Japanese have improved significantly. Um, and I guess... Like as how as much... they proved over Nanjing, didn't they? They, they had repeated raids that were getting larger and larger and larger before the ground assault. Yeah, like, yeah, and in these raids in like from 40, 41, like against Chongqing and all that, they're, they're huge. Like these are really big uh, air campaigns. They're conducted over long range with a high degree of sophistication, particularly for 1940. Um, and this is being noticed, at least by the, the observers in China, how much of this is being understood fully more broadly is a tricky question. Because usually the naval, like the attaches back in Tokyo that are trying, they're trying to distill some of this information. I don't know if, how much of it is truly getting through at times, um, and this also bleeds into this this weird interplay between what classified sources are saying and then what like popular writers and things are saying, which is far more dismissive, often openly racist or they're relying on the same kind of things you would see in classified reporting waiting to the Japanese imitating and everything. It's just that the tone and the severity to which they're leaning into it is more extreme. Um, and that is having a major impact on like pilot perceptions in, in the U S army air Corps. Um, in fact, when they were usually um, there's some really good stuff. I think actually it's brought up in bloody shambles, the, the opening preamble, uh, where they were talking to um, pursuit pilots, and they, they, um, yeah, there it is. So I, I was like, just looking at that earlier for something, <laughs> it, something that's it's coming great. up next year. But don't, don't worry, it's yeah, you know, and fabulous books, and of course we've just lost Chris Shores, haven't we? So that's, that's yeah, sad. and um, uh, Izawa Yasuo. Of well. course, yes, he, he passed away the other yeah. week as well. Yeah. And. Um, but yeah, like they asked yeah, pursuit pilots in the Philippines, like, hey, where were you? How were you feeling about Japanese aviation? And they didn't talk about like, you know, their field manual or biweekly intelligence summaries or any of this stuff. They 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 brought up an article um, by Zakharov. That's his name. Lucian Zakharov. Japan's Bush League Air Force uh, it was published in Air News, uh, I think, September 1941. And that's what they brought up as informing their their views on on japanese air power and that was of course very shortly before the start of the war um so i guess that opens up a whole discussion of like you know how how much of this was actually being disseminated and absorbed by pilots or um even commanding officers in the field you know there's anecdotes about how at least initially macarthur was in denial that they were Japanese pilots that were laying waste to his air power in the Philippines. They had to be Germans or something. Um, and yeah. which, which is nuts. Cause these guys have been fighting a war for 
nearly 10 years in China. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, hmm. it's shocking to see that. And again, I go back to that orange and strawberry thing where it's like, you're, you just try, you're trying to like understand how they are making the conclusions that they are based on what they're seeing. And again, like, as I've mentioned, like a lot of that reporting on like what they're observing in China, it's, it's actually really good stuff. Like so good that as a historian, you can use it to, to understand how the Japanese air services are learning and adapting. Um, but they're not necessarily drawing that connection. And that is very strongly felt, of course, in on the technical side of things where they're starting to, you know, flight test uh, stuff like captured Ki-27 and, uh, you know, a good Japanese army fighter from late 1930s. Um, the A-5M, they capture one and test fly it in China. I'm trying to remember if Chenault actually flew that one or if it was if he actually flew the Ki-27 or both. I can't recall from memory, but they're sending back good reporting um, on, on technical stuff. I've read a report on the captured A5M and in that report to the, to the person writing, it, uh, to their credit, they, they didn't just list out the technical characteristics and everything like that. They actually put in, and this is very, very rare, some analysis that's like, Hey guys, this is like almost entirely Japanese. Like there are some like cockpit instruments that are produced under license but like as far as the aircraft goes it's japanese um and it's good um but that kind of, those those dots being connected towards the end there is very rare um and you can see it in all sorts of pilot accounts too it's like their mindset was well they they copy and they're going to have worse planes than us because they're copying foreign designs and report after report after report regardless of good information coming out of china will underline that the japanese are I mean, in the words of one um, private uh, American industrialist who was helping or was working in a Japanese factory, they summarized it as the Japanese are known as notorious copyists. And therefore, they will always be several years behind us because they need stuff to copy. And it, it just coexisted. Good information and bad information just happily uh, sat side by side. And it kind of left, obviously, then the analysis up to the consumer of the intelligence and that consumer was potentially, you know, in, in extreme cases, racist, just outright, or they were just so convinced by by that those trends, those national characteristics, that they're going to probably pick the assessments that aren't emphasizing Japanese originality in, in key areas. And of course, that goes into personnel as well and doctrine. Um, you know, part of it, it, there's a lot going on, obviously, on the intention side and, and why the, the Western powers were caught by surprise. Of course, there's just entire forests have been demolished discussing all of that stuff. But one of those things floating around in there is that um, how, how can you anticipate the Japanese are going to do something so, uh, I guess you could say, bold or reckless? I would lean towards reckless um, when you have this belief that the Japanese are they're going to lack initiative and they're unoriginal and they're not going to do anything surprising because it'll freak themselves out. You know, those things are, don't necessarily uh, coexist. <laughs> so I suppose we can start wrapping this up really. The information was there. It wasn't collated in a way to make a decent enough argument for them to Sorry, the, the the Western powers to truly understand what that initial hit was going to bring to them in December 1941. Yeah, like the, the intelligence reporting, if you kind of had to just briefly summarize it at the higher levels. And as as I'd say, most modern like historiography on the subject underlines um, the stuff like their they don't have an industry that's going to stand up to us. They they have all of this laundry list of weaknesses in, in aviation industry. They they have a shortage of trained pilots. They have a shortage of reserve aircraft. All those those big factors for can Japan sustain a, a high intensity air war against the United States or British or in stupidly in, in a, a war of choice where you're fighting basically most of the world as Japan. Um, they're not going to be able to sustain that air war. Um, that stuff, at least in the, in the opinion of a lot of these, like, you know, Greg Kennedy and others, like, more recent scholars, those, those are very accurate. Um, now, my 
my opinion on this, and I'm still trying to like feel out the firm conclusion here is to play devil's advocate. How much credit do you give these, um, these classified reports, these military officers, military attaches, how much credit do you give them for stating the obvious? Um, and the reason why I say that is this isn't something that only came up in classified reporting and you needed access to Japanese uh, tours of Japanese factories. It's like you read like a New York times article from the late 1930s. Um, and they're pointing out these exact same things. You like Japan's Bush league air force, you know, despite the title, when you actually read it, um, yes, it's more extreme. It's, it's overtly racist at times, et cetera, et cetera. But he has a section where he's talking about those exact same industrial weaknesses like this isn't this isn't some unknowable or like super secret uh keen observation it's it's yeah the, the u.s is like tenfold times stronger than than japan and in a protracted war of attrition japan is going to get crushed uh the japanese themselves depending on the circle understood this and their own intelligence uh, assessments of, of U.S. aircraft production and everything, um, depending on what you looked at, they could actually be quite accurate. Or even if they were understating it, they were still understating it to a point where they they had an understanding that they would come nowhere close to matching, uh, you know, U.S. production figures for uh, for aircraft or anything like that. Um, so I guess my the conclusion I'm reaching toward is that yes, these these assessments of strategic weaknesses are accurate to a point, but I think they might have, I guess, say over egged the pudding, um, where maybe they're pushing it too far. To put it another way, all of these accurate assessments piling up year year on year on year on year on year about how the Japanese couldn't sustain a, an air war against the United States that they added up to something greater than the sum of their parts. Um, and it led to perhaps intentionally or not a bit of an underestimation of the threat posed by Japanese aviation over the short to medium term, instead of over an entire war of attrition, which I guess is kind of the, the main conclusion I make there of, uh, you know, they were, these observers were very keen to predict the downfall of Japanese air power that they kind of forgot about dealing with it until it fell apart. <laughs> um, and so as far as like the general assessment of like pilot quality, uh, you know, aircraft quality tactics, doctrine, et cetera, that is where a lot of the main errors occurred. And of course, a lot of those errors were concentrated in kind of adding to the shock and confusion and just pandemonium of that opening several months um, where this air power that you thought was either not an air power, um, as they would sometimes state. In fact, I think Zakharov in his article ends it with Japan is not an air power. <laughs> I think almost exact quote. Um, since I have it open, let me just see. Yes, Japan is not an air power. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, the that cruise kind of... of the Prince of Wales repulse will have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it, one key thing, though, that I am definitely in line with, with uh, pretty much the almost the entire bulk of the historiography, I mean, even John Dower way back in the mid-1980s when he wrote his book on, on race in the Pacific War, uh, War Without Mercy, even he states this explicitly, is that regardless of what errors in assessment that uh, you can find, and you can certainly find them, the they didn't cause the early defeats. You know, that, that, was, that was up to a lot of other different factors. And first and foremost among those was big picture, grand strategic, you know, the availability of forces um, is that the United States and the British, they only had so much that they could send to the Pacific um, and in the time that they had. Um, and it ended up in hindsight being enough. Now I know there's a lot more discussion, certainly on the British side about could they have sent more and when, um, I'm not going to pretend that I'm like up on all that literature because that's a lot of literature. <laughs> and I know there are very fierce debates there and I don't want to um, tre tread into that without having done all the reading. But the, the, the British wouldn't send latest stuff to Malta. Yeah. <laughs> S Singapore and Burma was 
completely out of out of sight, out of mind. That's my take yeah. on it. But yeah, yeah. Um, and but these assessments, like they weren't the root cause of mm. of those kinds of weaknesses, um, which means that ultimately, I guess as a as a historian, I'm placed in a weird position where I'm researching something, and one of my main conclusions is that it wasn't actually as significant as <laughs> <laughs> as people think. Um, I guess my my uh, take is that it probably had more impact on like almost on the historiography than it did on like the start of the war um, because there, this stuff does actually carry through the war. Like one thing, one assumption that I often see is that like uh, pre-war reporting bad, then the war starts, then the reporting gets good through experience. Um, and then that carries forward from there. And what I've seen is that actually there's a lot more continuity from pre-war reporting through the war into the post-war and then as a result of that into the post-war historiography, then I think people have acknowledged. Um, like, for example, the trope of Japanese unoriginality um, and it, co the tendency to copy, that definitely carries through. I mean, I still will get into internet fights with people who are absolutely convinced that like half of whatever the Japanese designed was a copy. Um, in fact, my one, I don't claim to be anybody, but my one major major win for human society was I, I did a video, I think like it was an hour long way back in 2020, uh, where I kind of ripped apart the notion that the, the zero was a copy. Um, and finally, somebody went to the Wikipedia page in English on the zero and deleted the, the section that was just like an entire paragraph of speculation about what it was a copy of, which took out about half the word count of the development section of the zero. I don't know if it's come back. I haven't checked in a couple of years, but it was gone for a while. Um, so it's like this, this stuff is still floating around, which is very interesting. And that's not me saying that, like, if you're writing a book on the Pacific War and you're looking at the evidence and you would conclude that, like, in the particular case, oh, this Japanese commander lacked initiative. Uh, that's not you being like a horrible monster. Um, it's just you. It's, it's something to be aware of that this stuff is floating around, and particularly when you're looking at like even stuff during the war, like accounts from various like U.S. or British or whatever military units. Like the people that are writing these are stewing in that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I don't can't recall exactly what it was, but I saw a while ago somebody wrote like or posted a. Um, a veteran account from, um, I think it was in Fall Kohima in Burma. And, um, the, the conclude, like the, the actual written account of the action was really interesting and, and all that. Um, and then you get to the conclusion and the conclusion was the Japanese didn't learn or have any initiative, which was directly contradicting all of the pages of testimony. This, this veteran had written where, he was talking about how they had to adapt and keep, you know, keep, stay flexible and, and meet this, miss, this Japanese adversary. And then your conclusion is that the Japanese adversary you were fighting actually didn't change at all, which would of course require you to not change either because you were clearly winning. But um, yeah, it's still floating around. Um, I guess that's my, and I wouldn't call it a hot take, but <laughs> lukewarm. I, I, yeah. No, I think I think that's that's an interesting thing to, to sort of wrap up on is the preconceptions are still floating around. This idea that you can have the evidence, but you still fall back on a trope. I think in in the social media age as well, that you can say the right things but conclude something completely different is is something to keep in mind. This has been fascinating and i've just looked at the time and we've been chatting for a while i we'll we'll do we'll do this again we'll and i'll give you more time to prepare next time um but the important thing is here, where can people find you to to start pestering you with questions and things like that where where can people find justin pike online yeah so i i uh uh quite righteously and and uh I, I nuked my Twitter, so that's gone. <laughs> um, but you can find me on Blue Sky, so Yay, I'm, I'm Justin, Justin Pike on. History. Uh, Pike with a Y, so P-Y-K-E uh, History mm. on Blue Sky. Um, that's probably where I'm most active. Um, I will pop up occasionally on 
YouTube history videos and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to actually engage with me, Blue Sky is the place to do it. Super. I'll, I'll put a I'll put a link in to the description for people just to click on it and go and join us. We're all on Blue Sky now. And to be fair, the aviation geekery over there is of a high quality. So join us. Yeah, it's I'd, fun. I'd argue it's it's better than it ever was on Twitter. Like I mm. my feed looks great. <laughs> it, the engagement on it is high. There's lots of people asking interesting stuff and mm -hmm. debating it in a in a way that I haven't seen for a while. So yeah, great. Justin, thank you so much. May you survive the biblical amounts of snow that are about to hit Calvary. <laughs> it gets me out of the house to shovel, I guess. <laughs> and one good thing about thank you for inviting me on. I, I'm always I'm, so bad at outros, by the way. I am so bad. No, no, this is true. I, I apologize for taking so long to get to it. Right, there we go. Join us on Police Skype. Come, come chat with us there. There we go. We'll wrap this one up. Bye-bye, everybody. I cannot thank Justin Pike enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. And I think you'll agree, that was a lot of information that we went through there and led to a lot of the interesting thoughts and ideas around those opening few years of the conflict in the Pacific, a few years, a few months, shall we say. But we're going to return to the subject in the Pacific. So I, as I said, I've criminally neglected the Pacific, and we need to look into more things. Zeros, for example, the cats as well. Um, lots to cover on that. So I'm looking out, there's, it is very windy here in Horsham, and there's a bird trying to fly past the window, and it's not working. It's quite funny. Like I said, episode 100 coming up. Join us on Patreon to get your say into what that could possibly be. Budgets and time and stuff coming up. Because after episode 100, we're going to take a little pause to do something um, a little bit different. But it will take some time to get it all together. So we have that coming up too. Thank you ever so much for your support. Please do the like and subscribe thing. And if you're listening to the podcast version, please pop some stars into your podcast app of choice. Leave a review. And until next time, we're going to have some Wings Over the Rockies episodes coming up, including the Missing Century series aircraft, the much-loved, and in our case, much maligned, F-101 Voodoo, which we do cover and we bleed it into the f4 quite nicely as well there at the fantastic wings over the rockies museum with the wonderful joe welding so that's coming up soon like and subscribe hit the bell don't miss anything out thank you for your support thanks for watching leave us some questions below justin will be checking that out join us on blue sky as well where the av geekery is going really nicely actually so it's a lot of fun a lot of good engagement lots of discussions check out the links in the description below for that until next time do take care of yourselves check in on your friends as well it's a time of year when stuff can get a bit difficult for people so be sure to check in make sure everybody's okay and of course do take care of yourselves bye bye I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Damcasters on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of ad. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.